Good evening, I'm Steve Crouch, Dean of the College of Science and Engineering. On behalf of the University of Minnesota, it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight for this public lecture. I especially want to welcome our visitors from outside the university. We're happy you could be with us this evening. Our speaker, Colonel Robert Cabana, is director of the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. He's a Minneapolis native and a graduate of Washburn High School. He has a BS degree in mathematics from the US Naval Academy and is an accomplished pilot and astronaut. He has logged over 7,000 hours in aircraft of 45 types and is a veteran of four uh, space flights with over 910 hours in, in space to his credit. He was mission commander on two of his four space flights, the STS-65 Columbia in July 1994 and the STS-88 Endeavour in December 1998. The latter flight was the first International Space Station assembly mission. Colonel Cabana was inducted into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame in 2008. He visited campus today to present scholarships to two College of Science and Engineering students on behalf of the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. I want to take this opportunity to congratulate the students. Rachel Sobel, a senior in biochemistry and computer science, and Sammy Shaker, a senior in chemistry and mathematics. I also want to take this opportunity to thank the um, Astronaut Scholarship Foundation for their generous support of our students. We even have more highly deserving students to support. The title of Colonel Cabana's talk tonight is Human Space Exploration, Past, Present, and Future. Please join me in welcoming Colonel Robert Cabana back to the University, back to Minnesota. Thank you, Dean. It, it is always a pleasure to come home to, uh, to Minnesota. And what a real pleasure it was to be able to present two scholarships uh, today from the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation to uh, Sammy and Rachel. You know, these are merit-based scholarships, and it's uh, $10,000, and it's one of the very few totally merit-based scholarships uh, in the world, and it's quite an honor for them. And I, I just, it, it really gives me pleasure to be able to do that. And I want to thank the University of Minnesota because they matched what ASF gave. So instead of awarding one scholarship, we got to award two, and I think that's pretty neat. <laughs> so I want to update your bio a, a little bit now, Dean. It's actually over 50 different aircraft, not 45. I, I, <laughs> A couple, a couple of months ago, I went down to Vero Beach and I got to fly an extra 300. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a low-wing aerobatic aircraft that they fly in the Red Bull Air Races, and Patty Wagstaff, the female aerobatic champion, flies one. It was awesome. I want one. Unfortunately, I, I can't afford one, but that's okay. It was still fun to fly. Uh, I had an absolutely great day today. I got to talk to a, a physics class, and what great questions. I just love talking to students. And then I went over to uh, Central High School in St. Paul and talked to a bunch of first robotic team students. And I am not worried about the future of our country at all. I, I travel around the United States a lot. I get to talk to a lot of bright young students. And let me tell you, we are doing an outstanding job educating our youth, and we are going to continue to be a world leader. And leading in space, that's part about being what a world leader is. So where are we going? I, I want to talk about where we are going in human spaceflight, but I'd like to put it in perspective a little bit. Now, I was kind of hoping, this is good that I don't see a lot of students in here that heard this talk earlier today. So uh, those that heard it before, you can take a nap, whatever, it's okay. And, and the rest of you, I'd like to educate you a little bit. So I don't think anybody needs education on that. That, of course, is the right flyer. Back on December 17th in 1903, Orville and Wilbur made the first powered flight of an aircraft. It traveled a distance of 120 feet and lasted about 20 seconds. So 120 feet, that's the length of the space shuttle, okay? 
this is one of my favorites. I, I, I took this picture when I was in DC a, a few months ago, and Charles Lindbergh is one of my heroes. I mean, how can he not be, right? He grew up in Minnesota, first person to fly solo across the Atlantic, grew up right in Little Falls. And how many of you read his autobiography, um, the Spirit of St. Louis. It's not even named after Charles Lindbergh. A few hands out there. Go read it, all right? He won the Pulitzer for it in 1953. But uh, Lindbergh, he didn't write about Charles Lindbergh. He wrote about his airplane, the Spirit of St. Louis. But what an outstanding uh, read. And you read about his life on the farm, and man, I can relate to that. My uh, grandparents had a family farm up north of Lake Itasca, south of Shevlin, Minnesota, and I, I had the best of both worlds. I, I graduated from Washburn High School, so I had the privilege of a a great education in the public schools here in Minneapolis, but I got to spend all my summers working on the farm. And you learn a lot working on a farm. But my goal, you know, when I was five years old, I got to see the Spirit of St. Louis and the Wright Flyer hanging from the ceiling of the Smithsonian, and I said, I want to fly. And, and that was my ambition. Well, unfortunately, all the airplanes and spaceships that I've flown are now in museums. <laughs> But I'm still holding out hope, all right? Because John Glenn was 77 when he flew his last uh, space flight, so I got a few good years left, and I'm shooting for that. But I don't know how many of you, has anybody been down to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, to our visitor center, and seen Atlantis? How many have seen Atlantis? All right, it's awesome. This was the last space shuttle to ever fly in space, and look at it. It looks like it's flying in space. What an amazing vehicle. We had an awesome 30-year history with the space program. The actual vehicle record is Discovery. Discovery is up at the Udvar Hazy facility at the Dulles Airport as Air and Space Museum in Washington, DC. And I, being the director of the Kennedy Space Center and having a few ties, uh, I closed the hatches on all the orbiters when they left KSC to go off to the various museums. And when I got, when I left Discovery, I mean, it looked like it was going to fly in space. Everything is installed, all the lockers, the waste management system, the galley, everything, the seats, and it, it, it looks like it's going to fly in space. Uh, Endeavor is out at the California Science Center in California. Right now it's in a temporary facility. Eventually they hope to mount it in the vertical, so it looks like it's on an external tank and solid rocket motors. But I am really proud of what we've done with Atlantis. And if you get a chance, you need to come down and uh, visit the Kennedy Vis Visitor Center, and you can see Atlantis, you can see early space, you can see uh, the Apollo Saturn V rocket, and uh, Edgar Mitchell's uh, Apollo 14 spacecraft, and it's a pretty cool place to come visit. Well, this is an historic photo. This is uh, America's first venture into space. This was May of 1961. Alan Shepard launched on a Mercury Redstone from the Cape. He went up, floated for about 15 minutes in space, came back down in the Atlantic Ocean. All right, May of 1961. I'm going to come back to that. Yuri Gagarin, by the way, flew April 12th of 1961 about a month prior, and Yuri actually orbited the Earth once. It didn't just do a parabolic flight. Now, technically, uh, I think that the United States was the first person to send someone into space orbit and come home, because uh, the Russians on their early Vostok uh, spacecraft uh, actually ejected out of it before they landed and came down in a parachute, whereas we actually landed in when John <laughs> landed. All right. So uh, rockets got bigger. John Glenn, in February of 1962, orbited the Earth, again on the Mercury spacecraft, on an Atlas rocket. And rockets continued to get bigger. And we went to the Gemini program. And uh, Gus Grissom and John Young further flew the first Gemini flight on a Titan rocket. And Gemini was really important to America's space program because Gemini, through Gemini, we learned everything that we needed to learn to go to the moon. We learned how to do spacewalks, how to stay in space for an extended period of time, how to do rendezvous and docking, all kinds of great stuff. It was all learned during the Gemini program. Then, in April, I mean in July of 1969, we went to the moon, all right, with Apollo 11. So now let's go back. May of 1961, all right, July of 1969. In a little over eight years, we went from doing a parabolic flight coming down in the Atlantic Ocean to walking on the moon. How did we do that in eight years? Well, the truth is we had four and a half percent of the federal budget, all right? It was a, <laughs> it was a different time. We didn't have a huge deficit and a flat budget. Right now, NASA has less than half of 1% of the federal budget, but I think we're doing a pretty darn good job with that, and we'll, we'll talk more about that too. 
After the Apollo program, we did Apollo Skylab, all right? And we sent three crews up to America's first space station, the Skylab. We also did the Apollo Soyuz test project and docked with the Russians and astronaut Deke Slayton, Slayton, one of the original Mercury 7, a UMD, University of Minnesota graduate, uh, majored in aero, uh, was the commander of that mission. Now this is an historic photo also. This is April 12, 1981, 20 years to the day that Yuri Gagarin flew in space, John Young and Bob Crippen, a couple of naval aviators, naval test pilots, launched on the Space Shuttle Columbia on America's first flight of the Space Shuttle, a reusable spacecraft that launched like a rocket, flew in space like a spaceship, and came home and landed like an airplane. And to me, this is the gutsiest test flight that was ever flown, because we didn't know it was going to work, and those guys took off and launched into space and landed three days later on a totally successful mission. Well, we had an awesome 30-year program with the Space Shuttle. We did all kinds of stuff during those 30 years. The Hubble Space Telescope. Look at what we accomplished with Hubble and all its servicing missions. You know, one of my favorite Hubble pictures, uh, in, in being from Minnesota, I, I kind of love the North Star. And how do you find the North Star? You look at the Big Dipper, and you come up the handle, and you go over to the cup, and you line up the two stars, and you look out the end, and there's the North Star, right? And we are the North Star State. Look, Waldo Nord, right? So. Um, Hubble took this thing called the deep field picture with Hubble. So go out tonight, and hopefully it's a clear night, look up at the Big Dipper, and put your hand just under the Big Dipper, close to it, and point up like that and look at your little fingernail, where there aren't any stars at all. And Hubble took a picture the size of what you see with your little fingernail, and they didn't just see stars, they saw hundreds of galaxies, all right? That is amazing. And we're actually building a, a new telescope that called the James Webb, that's going to allow us to see back further in time than even Hubble. Well, Hubble was one of those great things we got from the space shuttle. We flew laboratories in the payload bay, and we did science around the clock. That's from my third flight. We had a space lab back there, and we set the record at the time for the longest space shuttle mission, 16 days. It got broken later. Records are meant to be broken. But we did science 24 hours a day, 12 on, 12 off. And it was kind of a model for how we do science right now on the International Space Station. It was an international, international microgravity lab, too. We had 83 experiments from around the world. Very successful mission. Then, you know, we decided we're going to build this International Space Station, and we're going to do it with the Russians. So we had to learn how to work with the Russians. That's the Russian Mir Space Station. And in... Uh, Here's another shot of it. Not that big. We'll put this in perspective. This is uh, Hoot Gibson docked with the, uh, the Mir Space Station. We actually flew U.S. crews up to the Mir State, Space Station and learned how to work with the Russians. Now, remember the size of that space station with the shuttle next to it, because I got another picture coming. I think this is an historic picture also. I'm, I kind of like this one. This is uh, December of 1998. And that's the launch of Endeavour on the very first space station assembly mission. I think it's kind of cool because I was sitting in the commander's seat. <laughs> well, the International Space Station is awesome. That's what it looked like uh, 17 years ago in, uh, in 1998 when I left it. We took Node 1 Unity and the two pressurized uh, mating adapters that you see over there on the right, and we rendezvoused in space with Zarya. Zarya means sunrise in Russian, and that's the Russian functional cargo block. So we flew Unity up in the payload bay, lifted it out with the robotic arm, attached it to the uh, orbiter docking station, rendezvoused with Zarya, grabbed it with the arm, hooked it up to the other end of Unity, and then we did uh, three spacewalks to hook up all the data and electrical connectors. And uh, what was really cool is we powered up the computers and went inside the space station for the very first time. Uh, that was an awesome experience. But let me tell you, nobody was more surprised than me when I sent the commands on the computer, and it actually worked. <laughs> <laughs> we, we spent hours out at the Sonny Carter facility in Houston testing the software, finding problems. And then when we got down to Florida, originally the design for the space station was called ship and shoot. Build the module, ship it to the Cape, and shoot it to space. And we said, you know, I think we really ought to test it. Uh, before we uh, sent it up there more thoroughly. And uh, we got approval for what was called MEIT, Mission Essential Integration Test, down at the Cape. And having an emulator of the Russian FGB using the real hardware 
we ran through all the checks and everything, and we found a bunch of problems then. And we went ahead and, uh, and fixed them all, and dang, it worked perfect when we got on orbit. But the space station has grown since then. And this is the space station today. It is an awesome facility. It is the size of a football field. It's got the internal volume of a 747. And that, that node in FGB that we flew up, that's the node underneath there. That's the FGB. Now you've got Destiny, the US laboratory. You've got node two. You've got the European laboratory Columbus, the Japanese laboratory Kibo, which means hope in Japanese, and the Russian service module. Those are radiators to uh, get rid of the heat, solar arrays to generate uh, electricity. There's the station robotic arm contributed by Canada. It is just an awesome facility. Now, that, that's me inside Node 1 back in 1998, and look how nice and pristine and clean it is. This is Node 1 today. <laughs> Actually, it's not today, it's a little while back. That's Salazan Cherepov, one of our Russian cosmonaut buddies. And uh, Node 1 is now the gathering place. Inside Node 1, it's kind of like the central core of the space station. They have their meals there, the exercise equipment is there. Astronauts have to exercise, mandatory exercise, two hours a day in order to uh, maintain their fitness and not have calcium loss. You know, microgravity is really unique on the human body. And one of the effects is, you know, we have a skeletal structure to support our muscle mass here on Earth. When you get up in space, your brain says, I don't need this skeleton, and you start shedding calcium, just like osteoporosis here on Earth. Well, you, you can use drugs, but the best way we have found to maintain astronauts' muscle mass is through exercise. And we have three forms of exercise on the space station. There's a cycle ergometer, a bicycle. There's a treadmill, and they found that, you know, you essentially wear a harness that holds you down on it with bungees. And as you run, your bones need that pounding. But they've also found you need strength training. You need the resistive exercise. So we have a resistive exercise device, and it feels just like you're lifting weights. And so mandatory, two hours a day, exercise. Right now, one of the neat experiments going on, Scott Kelly is up there. And Scott, uh, naval aviator, test pilot, astronaut, he is up there for a year. Now, it's not the first time that anybody has flown in space for a year. Uh, the Russians have done it. They did it with a medical doctor back during Mir. Sergei Krikalov, one of my crewmates and also on the space station, uh, was up there for a year. But uh, Scott's going to be up there for a year. And what's unique about Scott is Scott has an identical twin brother, Mark. And Mark is down on the ground. And he agreed to go through the same tests as Scott in all the blood draws and everything. So we will have Scott in, year for, in space for a year and Mark down on the ground and be able to compare their data. I was uh, chief of the astronaut office when we selected uh, Mark and Scott and was on the astronaut selection board. And uh, we joked at the time that, uh, hey, we should interview one and select the other. But, <laughs> but we ended up picking both of them. And uh, it, it was really interesting. Uh, they both. They are identical twins. And they, at the time, they both had mustaches. And, uh, you know, I could tell them apart. And they couldn't figure out how I was doing it. One day, I met them at the gym, and they thought I was keying off their watches. So they traded watches, and they couldn't trick me. And, and the truth is, Scott's more serious than Mark. Mark's a little more easygoing. And when Mark smiles, his lip curls up a little higher than Scott's. <laughs> this is Don Pettit. In the, uh, in the US laboratory, Destiny. And you can see him on the cycle ergometer there doing a, uh, an aerobic test. Uh, what a neat guy. But you can see the lab has really gotten crowded up there. A lot of great science going on. So remember that picture of the shuttle docked with Mir? Here's the shuttle docked with the International Space Station. Again, that's 120 feet long. So you get some aspect of the size there. Here's another neat shot of the shuttle docked with the space station. What a phenomenal facility. Well, how do you get to space? All right, back in 1978, and I, I put this picture in here for a reason. This is the very first group of shuttle astronauts. They were selected in 1978, and they called themselves TFNG, 35 New Guys. Some folks think it was something else, but I go with 35 New Guys. <laughs> and uh, look at that picture. What do you see? You see men, women, black, white, Hispanic, Asian. I think one of the greatest contributions of the space shuttle to America's space program was that it brought diversity to America's space program. Instead of all white male test pilots, and at the end of Apollo, they threw in a few white scientists, you know, we had real diversity in America's space program. Not only that, the space shuttle accommodated from the fifth percentile female to the 95th percentile male in size. 
and we can't even do that today. Uh, that, that's pretty amazing. And the, the important thing about diversity is, you know, and one of my favorite, he's like a big brother to me, Mike Coates. Uh, he was, uh, I was his deputy when he was director of the Johnson uh, Space Center. He was also an astronaut. He was in this group, uh, uh, 35 new guys back in 1978. And he said, you know, it's diversity of thought that you're after, right? And he said one of the biggest diversities he found was it was the difference between the military guys and the civilian scientists. He said, because all the military guys thought the same. You know, it didn't matter if they were black, white, Hispanic, Asian, you know, whatever. But the, it, you got all those, uh, you know, uh, scientists in there in their Birkenstocks and stuff. And that, that really, you know, was diversity of thought. But if you want the best answer to the solution of a problem, you can't have everybody thinking the same. You need diversity to get to it. And that's what the space shuttle program did. It brought diversity to America's space program. Uh, training to be an astronaut, I, I talked to the students uh, at Central High and I talked this morning, you know, to be an astronaut, for any students in here aspiring astronauts, you gotta have a technical degree, math, engineering, or one of the physical scientists, sciences. You have to have uh, three years of experience in your field. You can substitute a master's for one year and a PhD for two more. But all the mission specialists have at least a master's. Most have their PhD as well as significant experience within their field. And for the pilot astronauts, 1,000 hours of pilot and command time in high performance jet aircraft. But uh, they say high, test pilot experience is highly desirable. They've never picked a pilot astronaut yet that wasn't a former military test pilot. So that, that's the, the basics to be an astronaut. And then once you're selected, it's training. And this is uh, the shuttle motion simulator. It looks like a box on stilts, but inside, it's just like being inside the space shuttle. Uh, the folks in mission control, when we did an integrated simulation, they couldn't tell the difference between one of our simulations and a real space flight over in mission control. In the left seat is where the commander sat, the pilot sat over in the right seat, actually the pilot in command and the co-pilot. Over on the commander's left side were all the controls for the environmental control system. We maintained it at 14.7 PSI, sea level pressure. Uh, we had a 3.02 partial pressure of oxygen, just like the Earth's atmosphere, 20% oxygen, 80% nitrogen relative, uh, low relative humidity at, you know, 72 to 74 degrees, very comfortable. Uh, it was for me. Nancy Curry was my flight engineer. She's rather petite with not an ounce of fat on her, and she had to wear a sweater a lot of the time. Um, the computers were controlled up above. That was where you turned them on, five general purpose computers. You interface with the computers through the uh, displays here and the keyboards here. Uh, the computer was the AP-101B computer, same computer that was in the B-1B bomber, built by IBM up in Owego, New York. Just to put things in perspective, now remember the space shuttle was thought of in the late 60s. They started design in the 70s. It was supposed to fly in 78 and flew its first flight in 1981. That computer had 104K of memory in it, all right? <laughs> then, then we upgraded in the 90s and we got to 256K of memory. I, I, got a, I got a thumb drive in my pocket. This thing's got like 18 gig on it, you know? Uh, but they were radiation hardened, very reliable computers. We actually uh, launched with Ascent software. We ran the first four computers in what was called the redundant set. So there was a voting logic between them. So that if one was bad, it got voted out and you just ran on three. Uh, but we also had a fifth computer that had backup software in it so that if we had a a generic software error that took down the redundant set, we'd engage the backup, and it had uh, separately coded software for ascent and entry that we could use. Then when we got on orbit, we loaded our on-orbit software, and when it was time to come home, we loaded our entry software. We actually did that from tape drives. Eventually, we moved to a, a digital mass memory unit. Even though the space shuttle may have looked the same when we stopped flying it, we continued to improve it and make modifications through its entire 30-year history. Over the pilot's uh, head there were the controls for the reaction control system that maintained our attitude on orbit, as well as the orbital maneuvering systems that, uh, that circularized our orbit and slowed us down to come home. Uh, very nasty, toxic propellants, monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide, MMH and N2O4, but they are very uh, stable and you don't need a spark plug. You have an inert gas that pressurizes this is due bipropellants. They come back to two ball valves. You send an electrical signal. The ball valves open. The bipropellants come together in the uh, pressure chamber and explode on contact. As long as the ball valves are open, you're getting thrust. Over on the pilot side, 
man, there's all kinds of switches over there. And if you move any one of them at the wrong time, really bad things happen. Uh, Hoot Gibson, who was chief of the astronaut office before me, Hoot had a saying, no malfunction is so bad that the pilot can't make it worse. And man, that was, <laughs> that was really true. So over on the pilot side, you can't see them. That was the electrical distribution system, three fuel cells that used oxygen and hydrogen to generate seven and a half kilowatts of electrical power on each one, plus our drinking water, the uh, auxiliary power units that powered the hydraulic system that uh, provided flight control for the gimbling the engines and the control surfaces, and the controls for the main engines. All right, doing a spacewalk. That's Jerry Ross and Jim Newman on the first space station assembly mission. You know, how do you train for something like that? Well, uh, this is NASA's microgravity research aircraft. It's a C-9. Prior to this, it was a KC-135. And that's on a 45 degree nose up maneuver getting ready to do a parabolic arc, where if you push over just right, everything floats in the back for about 30 seconds. You push over too hard, you're pressed against the ceiling. You don't push o over enough, it feels like you're walking on the moon. But if you do it just right, you get a, a zero-g profile that allows everybody in the back to be weightless. Now, think about this. You're traveling along, 1g, 2g pull, 1g, 0g, 1g, 2g, 1g, 2g, and you do that 30 times. In Houston, they call this the vomit comet. <laughs> Now, those guys looked like they were having fun. That was an astronaut candidate class in there. And the truth is, it was the most fun I ever had in an airplane when I wasn't flying it. We actually take experiments up and qualify them uh, aboard the zero-g aircraft before we actually send them into space sometimes. Now, you cannot get into a spacesuit in 30 seconds. And you cannot do everything that you're going to do on a spacewalk in 30, 30 second intervals. So we have another facility down in Houston, and this is still in use today. And it's called the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. And it is a huge swimming pool. And inside that pool is a full-size scale model of the International Space Station. Now, since this picture was taken, the <laughs> orbiter payload bay has been taken out of there. And there's even a couple more modules in there. But what we do is we put the astronauts into that EVA suit. And then we lower them down inside the pool, all right? And we weight them out so that they're neutrally buoyant. They don't sink to the bottom or float to the surface. It's not what it's really like to be weightless, but it is as close as we can get on Earth in order to practice for those spacewalks. Um, at one time, especially for the Hubble missions, where there were very specific tasks that had to be done in a short period of time, we trained about 10 to 1. For a five-hour spacewalk, you would spend 10, uh, 50 hours in the pool training for that five-hour spacewalk. So if you had three spacewalks to do, you know, that's 150 hours that you're doing to get ready for that. We've got it down now, it's about seven to one, and we train more generic skills as opposed to specific tasks. Because we don't know what's gonna break on the space station or what the crew is gonna have to do while they're up there. We want them prepared for anything. Again, just to put things in perspective, you can see that truss structure, get some scale of size, there's the astronaut practicing that EVA. The space station is just huge. For those of us that are pilots, we had a fleet of T-38s to maintain our flight proficiency. Also, a lot of the mission specialists, they'd never been in a high-performance jet aircraft. We put them in there, and they learned to be good crew members, and those skills carried over to being good astronauts. This is an interim picture. We've even upgraded since then, since this, but all these round knobs, dials, and gauges that used to be all over, there's glass here and glass down here. Now the entire cockpit is glass, just like a modern uh, jet fighter. Uh, but these are, these are old, but very uh, well-maintained, uh, good aircraft uh, for astronauts. The first time you land a space shuttle, and that was my first landing, that's Columbia, in July of 1994, landing at uh, the Kennedy Space Center. Well, that's the first time you ever landed. So how do you train for something like that? You can practice that steep L over D approach in a T-38, but that's not quite the same. So actually, we had a, a fleet of four Grumman Gulfstream IIs. And in the back was a digital computer that had a model following routine of the orbiter's aerodynamics. And with the landing gear down and running the engines in reverse thrust while you were airborne, uh, you could make it fall out of the sky like the space shuttle. <laughs> A normal G2 has a lift to drag ratio of about 13. That means for every mile above the ground, it can glide 13 miles, all right? Uh, the space shuttle has an L over D of four. It's just dropping. So it's a 20 degree dive at 295 knots and then 1600 feet above the ground, you start pulling out, transitioning to a one and a half degree inner glide slope, touching down at 200. That's what it looks like out the window, going into Edwards Air Force Base. 
And this is the cockpit of the G2. If you notice, the left seat, all the controls and displays are just like the space shuttle, normal G2 over here. So we'd jump in a T-38, fly out to El Paso, Texas, climb into the G2 with one of the instructors, climb up to 30,000 feet over the lake bed at White Sands, New Mexico, and we'd get 10 of these dives in a training mission. So the first time I landed the space shuttle, I felt like I'd done it a thousand times before, and I had in the shuttle training aircraft. Now, we're working a robotic arm. How do you train for something like that? That's Nancy Curry, my flight engineer, PhD in industrial engineering, uh, was an Army helicopter pilot before she came to uh, NASA, working the robotic arm, lifting Unity out of the payload bay. And she had about an inch or less of clearance on each side of, as she lifted that out. And uh, I, I used to tease her. It was like watching grass grow. She had such fine control, you could hardly see the thing moving. But she wasn't going to damage anything, and she didn't. So she pulled it out of the payload bay, and we adopted it to the orbiter docking station. Uh, this is one of the simulators that we had in Houston. And all the controls and displays over here, the monitors, the hand controllers, everything's just like working the robotic arm in space. And this is kind of distorted when I took this picture. It's not very good. It was a dome simulator. And if you actually, this is one of the pressurized mating adapters. And because of the perspective from where I took it, it looks really big. But if you were looking out the window there, it would look just like you were looking out the window in the uh, shuttle payload bay. Rendezvous in space is also a challenge. You can fly the orbiter from the commander's seat on orbit or from the aft flight deck. Two hand controllers, a rotational hand controller and a translational hand controller. The rotational hand controller goes like this, like this, and like this, and it controls pitch, roll, and yaw of the space shuttle. Translational hand controller goes in, out, left, right, up, down. And it translates the orbiter forward and back, side to side, up and down. It's really hard to fly six degrees of freedom at once, so we program the digital autopilot which is located right here, to maintain our attitude so we only have to worry about the translations. That's looking out the window with uh, Unity attached to the orbiter docking station, rendezvous in Mazaria. Uh, the orbiter flies so darn well. It's just absolutely precise. It's really nice. Uh, I got asked earlier today by one of the students, were you ever scared? Did anything ever happen where you felt you know, worried? And, and truthfully, there was. So you can't see it here. But after uh, this, you know, I flew it right down in the payload bay behind the node. This is looking out the overhead window. When I looked out the aft window, you couldn't see it. All right? But I had a centerline camera looking up, and I had another camera on the arm. And remember those two displays on the side of the robotic arm? So that's what I was looking at. I was looking at the view from the robotic arm, keeping it centered forward and back and up and down. And uh, I was looking at that centerline camera, keeping it centered. And I had it just perfectly stable. I'd nailed it. It was right there. But we couldn't grapple it. It was like three feet from the end of the arm. We couldn't grab it until we got over a Russian comm site so that they could guarantee that the FGV was in free drift, that its control system wasn't on. Because you wouldn't want to grab it and have its control system on and, and fight the arm and break it. So we're just sitting there motoring along, waiting to get over a Russian ground site. And the orbiter, remember I said we program attitude in the digital autopilot. Well, the orbiter has uh, what's called a dead band, all right? So everything is just fine. It's floating there. And all of a sudden, it drifted where it hit the edge of the dead band. It fired the jets to center it back up and keep it in the right attitude. Well, when it did that, because of the mode that we were in, you don't get a pure pitch roll or yaw. What happens is the rolling moment couples into a translation. And all of a sudden, this 45,000-pound mass was moving into the payload bay and toward the arm. And that's not good, you know? And, and so I started firing the thrusters to back away from it, and nothing's happening. <laughs> and uh, what I was in, I was in, you, there are two modes to the digital autopilot, and you program them the way you want it, depending on what you're doing. And I was in the BDAP for very fine, precise control. And I uh, had the common sense to switch to the ADAP, which had more control power, and was able to back away from it and then come back in and get everything all stable again. Well, Jim Newman, he's a PhD physicist that was on my crew, and Jim is really a smart guy. He used to train astronauts before he got selected on his fifth try to, to be one. And Jim wrote this program. Remember I said those computers only had 104K of memory, 256 when I was flying it? Well, uh, what we did was, to get more computers on board and have more capability, we flew IBM 760XD laptops, and we set up our own local area network, plugged in, pulled uh, data off the orbiter, and fed it to these laptop computers that we had on our own local area network that had 
you know, world map on it that showed where you were over the Earth at any one point and a bunch of other programs. But he actually wrote a program that was called RPOP, Rendezvous Proximity and Operations Program, and he was an expert on rendezvous. So all during the rendezvous, he's giving me advice. You know, hey, Bob, what do you think about a couple of ins? How about an out? How about an out? You know, and I'm listening to this. I also got the KU band antenna, rendezvous radar, giving me uh, range and range rate. I got somebody with a handheld laser shooting the FGB, giving me range and range rate. I got the computers on the orbiter telling me where we are. I got RPOP and Newman. And uh, I'm filtering all this with my Coleman filter, doing what I think is the right thing to do. And we had a perfect rendezvous. And uh, when this happened, there was just dead silence in the cockpit. And so when it was all over, I said, uh, Jim. Actually, I didn't say Jim. This is another long story, but we all had dog names, and I won't go into that, but Jim's dog name was Pluto, and, and it, it was really named after the planet Pluto, which is now a dwarf planet, which isn't really a planet, but it's still a planet to me. <laughs> but uh, Pluto is off in an orbit all its own, and that was Newman. Anyway, so Jim was just totally silent, and I said, Pluto, how come you didn't offer me some advice? And he says, well, I know when to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> So that was out the window, and that's in the simulator, only I don't have the FGB in it. I extremely good simulators that we trained on. So when we actually got to uh, do everything in space, we were very, very well prepared for it. Well, unfortunately, all things have to come to an end. And what I tell my team at the Kennedy Space Center is, you can't have something better without change. Change is a constant in our lives. And, you know, if you want to keep doing the same thing, fine. But you're never going to be better. You have to change to be better. And we want to change. We want to get out of low Earth orbit, and we want to explore beyond our home planet. So the space shuttle program had to end, because they weren't going to give us more money. Remember that flat budget? So in order to do something new, you're going to have to stop doing something. So we had to stop flying the space shuttle, all right? Uh, right now, we still got crews on the International Space Station. How do we get them there? Well, we rely on our Russian partners using the Soyuz rocket and the Soyuz spacecraft. A uh, very reliable uh, crew vehicle. This is over in Baikonur at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. And this is an historic picture also because we're, uh, this month, uh, celebrating 15 years of continual presence on the International Space Station. And this is the very first crew of the International Space Station. That's Yuri Gudzinko. He was the flight engineer on the uh, mission and the Soyuz commander. That's Bill Shepard. Uh, a Navy SEAL and classmate of mine from the U.S. Naval Academy. He was the commander of the mission. And that's uh, Sergei Krikalov. And Sergei flew with me on uh, STS-88 and was also on this crew plus another space station crew. Sergei is unique. He has more time in space than any other human on planet Earth. But 15 years now, we've had a continual human presence in space aboard the International Space Station. And that's that Soyuz rocket getting ready to launch there in Kazakhstan. And that's what it looks like when a Soyuz capsule comes home on the steps of Kazakhstan. And uh, uh, one of my Russian buddies, uh, he runs the control center over there, he said, they told me it was a soft landing. Uh, and he said, when we landed, the crystal popped off my watch. <laughs> so <laughs> I kind of like the way the space shuttle lands. My crew didn't even know we touched down. All right, I'm going to see if I can do this now. Awesome. Whoa, oh, 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 get over there. I guess I could look at the computer. That's easier. Piercing the pre-dawn sky as the space shuttle announces its arrival at the launch site with its signature sound of twin sonic booms having gone subsonic for the last time. Having fired the imagination of a generation, a ship like no other, its place in history secured, the space shuttle pulls into port for the last time. Humanity has left Earth many times before from our Florida shoreline. Some of the most inspiring missions of adventure began here at Kennedy Space Center and would not have been successful without our hard work. That work and expertise will always be a hallmark of our efforts here, though we are retooling for the future. Kennedy helped America take important steps before and now. We are getting ready to make our next giant leap. We are remaking NASA's Kennedy Space Center into the world's premier multi-user spaceport, ultimately launching missions beyond low Earth orbit and taking people to destinations 
far beyond anywhere humans have gone before. Making unneeded facilities available to commercial space is one of the best ways to enable this new industry. We're also making the Kennedy Space Center more accessible to the entrepreneurs who are already driving the next space age. It began with opening up facilities at Kennedy to requests that would use them in new and different ways. A team from Johnson Space Center is using a lunar simulation field to make free flights of an autonomous lander at the shuttle runway. Aerospace companies are exploring the iconic facility as a starting point and finish line of suborbital missions carrying experiments and paying passengers into weightlessness. No one has ever tried to repurpose a major installation like the Kennedy Space Center, but we are getting it done. Up at Launch Complex 39 and the Vehicle Assembly Building area, crews got to work replacing infrastructure that was installed at the beginning of the space age. The computers, wiring and cabling were cutting edge 50 years ago and got America to the moon. Now though, the equipment was worn and obsolete. The changes reached deep into the heart of the landmark Vehicle Assembly Building. Rusted pipes, corroded cables, antiquated data and electrical wiring were removed, fashioning the crown jewel of the Kennedy Space Center into a facility capable of assembling the next generation of American rockets for both private companies and NASA missions. NASA began work on the Space Launch System design, a gigantic rocket capable of taking our astronauts far beyond low Earth orbit. With this 32-story super rocket being built in the spirit of Saturn V, we knew we would be looking again at reaching far out into space. Asteroids and Mars are suddenly within reach, but we knew it would take a special launch complex to handle it. We didn't have to look far for the foundation, Launch Complex 39B, right here. Cranes and workers descended on Launch Complex 39B and began their critical work. They took down the fixed service structure and rotating service structure built for the space shuttle. The salt air on the coast of the Atlantic Ocean took its toll on the proud structures, but workers soon took to restoring their glory. They sandblasted fuel and support lines that ran from storage tanks to the pad and to the spacecraft. As in the VAB, conduits and cables were torn out and replaced with modern electronics and capabilities undreamt of previously. While they're getting ready for our new rocket, engineers and technicians at the other end of the Space Center, in a place we call the Operations and Checkout Building, are getting ready for a new spaceship. This is the high bay. It's the pristine work area where engineers and technicians just finished assembling the Orion for its first test flight. It's kind of like a garage for spaceships. And remember that part about making the VAB able to handle more than one rocket and spacecraft? Well, that's what we're doing here, too. Lockheed Martin, who assembled the Orion, can use this assembly area for other spacecraft when they're not working on Orion. It's good to think about the future and make plans, but all of us out here knew we had to keep doing what we are here for, launching rockets. Although the shuttle retired, NASA never stopped exploring. In fact, in many ways, we picked up the pace. We launched the huge Juno spacecraft to Jupiter, the first probe dispatched to the gas giant since NASA's Galileo in 1989. Kennedy's teams continued going to Vandenberg Air Force Base to launch Earth Observing Mission, and no one will ever forget the Curiosity rover we launched to Mars. Right now, that car-sized laboratory is traversing the rust-colored soil of the red planet, unlocking geologic mysteries we didn't even know to ask about. The International Space Station has been counting on us too. Just as we did during shuttle, we continue to deliver. Cargo resupply missions launching from Florida gave Kennedy its first look at its spaceport destiny. Rockets and spacecraft built by private companies went from experimental to operational. Their launches became common sights. Aboard the space station, crew members were able to unpack the cargo craft to find supplies and the all-important scientific experiments they would operate. 
The space station needs are also driving a new approach to doing business with America's aerospace firms. In the commercial crew program, after working with our partners for the last four years, we are looking forward to seeing their hardware, but we are going to love to watch them launch our crews to the International Space Station. We've made the initial transition to become a multi-user spaceport, but we still have a ways to go to fully implement our vision. We're solidifying our position as America's preeminent spaceport, supporting both government and commercial launches to and from low Earth orbit and beyond. A spaceport worthy of all those who've gone before and of those who will one day take us on a journey to Mars. All right, so let's talk about that, uh, that future a little bit, about where we're going and how we're going to get there. Uh, we have changed tremendously at the Kennedy Space Center since that last shuttle mission in July of 2011. Uh, in the last four years, you know, I, I never, uh, I don't think I would have picked this time in our history to be director of the Kennedy Space Center, but I can't imagine not being director of the Kennedy Space Center right now. We got to fly out the last six shuttle missions safely. The last mission was the best mission we flew in the whole 135 as far as processing that vehicle is concerned. And just to put in perspective the dedication of that team at KSC, on the Thursday that uh, Atlantis landed, the very next day on that Friday, 2,000 aerospace workers were laid off and out the door. We went from a workforce of 15,000 at the end of shuttle to 7,800 after shuttle. I've got uh, about 1,960 civil servants working uh, there at the Kennedy Space Center right now and about 5,500 uh, contractors compared to what it was. To put things in perspective, at the peak of the Apollo program, there were um, 22,000 contractors and civil servants working at the Cape. At the peak of shuttle, about 18,000, but the last three years it leveled off about 15,000. Now, we're going to stay where we are. The budget drives how many people that you have. So from a government point of view, supporting government missions, we're going to stay at about 7,800 total. But KSC is going to grow, and we're going to grow because of the commercial operations that we're bringing to the Cape. So let, let's talk about that transition. This is launch pad 39A in the past. 39A is the launch pad that all the missions flew to the moon from on Apollo. Uh, 39B launched the uh, missions to uh, Skylab and Apollo Soyuz test project, and then the space shuttle utilized both pads. Today, we have a 20-year use agreement with SpaceX, and they're going to be launching their Falcon 9 crew vehicle and the Falcon 9 Heavy from launch pad 39A, and they are totally refurbishing that pad. Uh, they've already changed all the infrastructure down here, and this rotating service structure is going to come down. They've built this huge uh, horizontal processing facility. Uh, they are getting it done. Uh, or we had three orbital processing facilities that were no longer needed. Now, we could have just torn them down. Nobody said, go make this useful for commercial space. All I really had to do was make pad 39B available for the SLS. But we looked, what can we do? And in orbiter processing facility one and two, that is now a Boeing facility, home of the X-37, the Air Force's orbital space plane. Over in orbital processing facility three, that is now Boeing's facility for their CST-100 uh, Starliner spacecraft, their entry into the commercial crew market that launches on an Atlas V rocket. Blue Origin has come to the Cape. They're going to be operating from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station on Launch Complex 36, but they are going to be building a facility in Exploration Park, and I'll show you where that is. This is Launch Pad 39B in the past with the shuttle. Today you saw pictures of it in the video. This is our multi-user space pad. This is the pad, Launch Pad B is where SLS is going to launch from. This is the pad that we are going to launch to Mars from. How many of you have seen, how many read the book, The Martian? How many saw the movie? Yeah, more saw the movie. And too bad, you should have read the book first. You know, <laughs> It had more detail, helped you fill in all those blanks in the movie. But it was awesome, wasn't it? Wasn't it cool? It was really neat. The sad part is there are people that walked out of that movie and thought it was based on a true story. You know? <laughs> but I walked out of that movie pumped. I said, I want to make this happen for real. 
Except for that part about leaving them on Mars. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we can do this. All that stuff you saw in that movie, we are putting in place the infrastructure right now to make that reality. And launch pad 39... Uh, B is part of it. Uh, you saw him pulling all that copper wire out. You, you know, it's over uh, three miles back to the, uh, that's the vehicle assembly building. The launch center is right there where the firing rooms are. It's over three miles back there, and there's tunnels that run back there, and that was all full of copper wire. We pulled all that copper wire out of the VAB and the pad and the tunnels and stuff. We made $620,000 in scrap off the copper that we reinvested <laughs> back into the project. It's now all fiber optic. And, uh, you know, that's a state-of-the-art lightning protection system. We, we refurbish the, uh, the water sound suppression system. We refurbish the uh, propellant distribution system. Notice how far apart those are? That's because that's liquid hydrogen and that's liquid oxygen. You don't want to get those two together. Um, the flame trench is in the process of being redone right now. But the neat part about this is what you see right there, that low part, that's where the mobile launcher interfaces with the pad. So you have a mobile launcher with a common interface to the pad, but it is unique for your rocket. We can use this launch pad for more than just the space launch system. Uh, also out at that pad within the confines of it is pad 39C, and this is a, uh, a, a small rocket capability for like CubeSats, small satellites that we could launch from there. This is the mobile launcher, all right? So uh, you can see it here, it's been modified. This was actually built during the Constellation program that got canceled, and it wasn't even complete. Um, it, it wasn't quite done, and it was less expensive to complete it than it would have been to novate the contract. So that was like $230 million of structural steel just sitting there, and it sat. And uh, when we came up with the final design for the space launch system, we said, can we utilize that mobile launcher and not let it go to waste? And it was originally designed for a single stick solid, and we said, yes, we can. And we had to do a bunch of structural modifications, but it now accommodates a liquid core with two solids, and we're in the process of installing all the systems in it right now. The swing arms, this is a crew access arm. This is the, uh, another one of the tilt-up umbilicals that interfaces with the module. Uh, all of that is in test in the launch environment test facility right now, and it's being installed on the mobile launcher to support the SLS. Over in the uh, vehicle assembly building, Hive A3. All the shuttle platforms have been taken out of there and we're installing the platforms for SLS. And when I say platforms, uh, man, these things are huge. They're the size of a building. This is what the Hive A looks like with the platforms out of it. Uh, crawler Transporter 2 is over in the Vehicle Assembly Building. We have two crawler transporters. They were built in the 60s for the Apollo program. We used them all through shuttle. We're upgrading them now uh, to accommodate the heavier weights of the SLS. We got uh, new brakes. Aren't those cool? See those disc brakes, that nice and blue and painted brakes there? And uh, just for perspective, see that tread? Each one of those tread weighs one ton. This thing weighs over six million pounds. We got new wheel bearings to accommodate the heavier weights, uh, new jacking and elevation cylinders, new generators. Uh, this is the crawler transporter that's going to roll out of the VAB and take us to Mars one day. Uh, here's one of those shuttle platforms, the size of a small building coming out of the high bay. This is one of the new platforms uh, being delivered uh, across the bridge to the Kennedy Space Center. And what we have done is we have made it so these platforms are adjustable. Uh, so as the rocket grows and the outer mold line changes, we don't have to redesign the whole building. They adjust 8 to 10 feet up and down, and then they have inserts in them so that if the rocket gets bigger, we can take out the inserts that's there and put in a different one. And uh, it, it's really a great design. So this is going to be ready for the rocket when it arrives early in 2018. We'll talk more about that. The space launch system itself, it has a uh, liquid core, hydrogen and oxygen, just like the space shuttle. In fact, we're utilizing space shuttle main engines. The space shuttle had 18 engines left over after the space shuttle program. And these are the world's most fuel efficient liquid rocket engine. They're in storage at the Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. And uh, we're going to utilize those, uh, four of them, instead of three on a space launch system. And then we're utilizing solid rocket motors like the shuttle. In fact, they're the same casings, but instead of four segments high, they're five segments high for more thrust. You saw those pictures in the uh, ONC high bay. This is during Apollo. That's the Apollo command module and service module. This is Orion. 
a crew of four with its uh, command module prior to its test flight last December, December 5th of last year. We flew it on a Delta IV Heavy, took it out 3,600 miles from Earth, and it was a flawless test flight. It re-entered at 85% lunar re-entry velocity, checked out the thermal protection system. All the systems just performed flawlessly. Landed off of Baja, off the coast of California, was recovered and brought back to KSC. The next flight of Orion is going to be on the Space Launch System, the big rocket from Pad 39B, right now scheduled for the fall of 2018. The Launch Control Center during Apollo, Shuttle, and today. This is firing room one, and uh, we're ready to go. We're installing all the software and testing, getting ready for SLS. In firing room four, we've actually converted it. You can see four bays there for uh, commercial operations. And this is, uh, this is our new headquarters building. This is actually kind of cool. This is a, uh, a minimum league goal, uh, environmentally good building. Uh, we are tearing down three buildings, in, including the old headquarters. We built a new data center and got rid of this huge computer complex facility that was built you know, for IBM mainframes back in the 60s. And uh, by tearing down these three buildings and having this new building plus the new data center, I'm saving $6 million a year in operating expenses. The building will pay for itself in 10 years. It's going to be awesome. So that's our future. Well, well let me back up. I guess I got a couple more here. This is, I mentioned Exploration Park. This is actually uh, the Space Life Sciences Lab here. This is the gate into the Kennedy Space Center. This is on Kennedy property, but it's outside the secure perimeter. And it's an industrial park. Uh, anchored with the Space Life Sciences Lab. This is phase two over here. I said Blue Origin was coming to uh, KSC. Uh, they're going to be launching from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, but they're going to have a manufacturing processing facility here. And then the shuttle landing facility, I've turned that over to the Space, uh, to space Florida, uh, a government entity to maintain and operate. It saves me $1.2 million a year, but it allows for the commercial uh, operations here at uh, the SLF for suborbital flights. You saw x -Corps with their little airplane. Virgin Galactic wants to operate out of here. There are folks that you saw that large airplane dropping a rocket, horizontal launch capability. Uh, so this is theirs to uh, develop. So we have an absolutely outstanding future. We are paving the way to explore beyond our home planet, to establish a presence in the solar system, while at the same time enabling commercial operations to uh, low Earth orbit. Uh, a cost savings for the government, but still keeping America at the forefront of leadership in space. And I, I can't tell you how proud I am of my entire KSC team. They are the world's greatest uh, group of technicians and engineers anywhere. And all you got to do is point them in the right direction and uh, give them the resources to get the job done, and they make it happen. So if anybody says NASA's shut down, NASA's not doing anything, you remember all the things that I told you about, and you tell them, you are wrong. NASA's, uh, NASA's doing great stuff, and uh, it's great to be a part of it. So I think, do I have a few minutes for questions, Dean? So I'd like to open up to any questions that you got about America's space program, finding space, where we're going, or what we're doing. Don't be shy. Now, the kids were really good. They asked a lot of great questions. Yes, sir. What, a, oh. what about launching modules and putting them together at the uh, space station? You could then have larger than just trying to launch from Earth. And you know you could have more going to Mars or other planets. Have you considered that sending modules up and putting them together? Yeah, the space station isn't in exactly in the right orbit for being able to do that. Uh, it's in a 51.6 degree orbit, and you'd want to be in a different orbit in order to make that happen. But um, there are there's a commercial company. It's called Bigelow Aerospace out in Las Vegas, and he's utilizing NASA technology uh, for expandable modules. Uh, and he's launched a couple on Russian rockets that he's got tested up in space. They have no environmental control system. We're going to launch one of his modules up to the space station and check it out. So maybe something like that could be used for a habitability module for future applications, uh, you know, on Mars, anywhere else uh, as part of a habitability module to get to Mars. But we haven't actually looked at assembling on the International Space Station and then going from there. There's a young lady, I think, has a question here. What does it look like in the new spaceship? Oh, man. 
Well, you know, I have not got to fly the new spaceship, but I did crawl inside the simulator, the mock-up that they have in Houston, and it's really cool. It's a lot smaller than the space shuttle, but it's a lot bigger than the Apollo capsule, and it's really neat. And it's just going to be used to get the crews to and from Earth into space, but when we go anywhere, we're going to take that capsule and we're going to dock it with a bigger module that we can actually live in that's really roomy and, and nice. So it's a pretty cool spaceship, and it, uh, I'd fly it, you know, <laughs> if I could. But you could fly it. Maybe you could go to Mars. You could be the commander. Would that be cool? Do you like, do you like math? Do you like school? Oh, come on. <laughs> I like school. Don't you like school? Isn't it, isn't it just a little bit fun sometimes? <laughs> Dad, you're going to have to work on that. Back here. My question is, Yeah, you know, actually, um, I don't know the answer to that. It's, it is a concern, all right? But right now, we don't have any plans to launch anything up there to, uh, to clean it up. Um, every one of my flights, we had what we call a conjunction with a piece of space debris where we had to uh, maneuver the orbiter so that it didn't hit us. Um, you know, you get those annoying rock chips in your window and you get that little starburst in the window. <laughs> my third flight, I had one that was about that big. It was over on the pilot side, though, so I didn't worry about it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when you're going 17,500 miles an hour, you run into a, a small little fleck of paint and it's going gonna, it's gonna to chip something. But uh, the orbiter had uh, three windows. They were built by Corning up in New York, and they were each about an inch thick. And you talk about perfect glass. It looked like you were looking through a single small window pane. But it, you had a, uh, a protective pane on the inside, a pressure pane, and then a thermal pane on the outside. So we weren't real worried about having that chip. But every time the orbiter flew, there were about three to four windows that had to be replaced because of little chips in them. They could polish them out to a certain extent, but if they were too deep, they actually had to replace the uh, window. And uh, we got lucky. We never had anything cause damage when it hit the, uh, hit the orbiter. But, you know, in the payload bay doors, there were radiators that had uh, Freon in it for cooling uh, the water, hot water on the uh, orbiter that was part of the air conditioning system. But, you know, there were micrometeorite hits, and they just happened to hit between the tubes that had the Freon in it you know, and punch a hole. So the stuff's up there. And every now and then the space station actually has to maneuver for a conjunction with something. And if they don't have time to maneuver, they'll actually send the crew to get into their Soyuz spacecraft just in case something hits and they have a, a, a loss of, of pressure. Yes, sir. What year was that? Well, I want to say 87. <laughs> okay, I have no idea. <laughs> I became the director in 2007. <laughs> but no, I, you know, there were a lot of different concepts that, that never became uh, reality. And the Kennedy Visitor Center today is much different than when you saw it. You need to come back and see it again. It, uh, wait, I got this young lady right here with her hand up. How tall is an average rocket? And uh, which rocket? Average. Average rocket. Oh, well, let's see. This one's going to be like 300 and some feet tall. Yeah, you know, probably uh, the space shuttle was 122 feet long, but it was attached to that external tank that was even longer. Uh, I'll, I'll say 150, 200 feet. I, you know, that's a great idea. You know what you need to do? You need to get on the internet and you need to Google Atlas V. All right, built by the United uh, Launch Alliance. And uh, that's a mainstay of America's rockets right now. That's what launched Curiosity to Mars. And then Google uh, Delta IV. That's a, that's a big rocket, too. And Google uh, SpaceX and see what a Falcon 9 is. And I bet they tell you on there. And that would be a neat project to figure out how big those rockets are. Okay? 
Well, I'm sorry, you had your hand up. What's your budget? Oh, my budget. Okay. Not enough. <laughs> NASA's, NASA's budget, and I think I'm being cut off here. I'll tell you what, when this ends, I'll, I'll hang around for a little bit. If you've got more questions, please come up. NASA's budget is about $18 billion a year, and uh, that's a lot of money. Uh, unfortunately, we've got about $21 billion in content that we have to squeeze in there. Uh, the Kennedy Space Center budget, because, you know, my budget includes all the money for the projects in the programs. And I've got the ground systems development program that's making all those modifications. I've got the commercial crew program that's supplying money to both Boeing and SpaceX to develop that uh, commercial capability. I've got um, the launch services program that procures all our rockets for our science missions. And I've got the International Space Station project that does the logistics for the International Space Station. So the majority of money that comes to KSC goes to the programs to do program work. The, it's about $2 billion a year total. Of that $2 billion, the money that I have to actually run the center is about $350 million. And that pays everybody's salaries and uh, maintains all the facilities and stuff. And there's a lot of stuff that I'm just hoping doesn't break, uh, you know. But uh, I've got, like I said, about 7,800 civil servants. We're on a 144,000 acre wildlife uh, reserve and a lot of really neat facilities that are critical to our nation's uh, future that we're taking very good care of. And I want you to know, I treat every one of those dollars like it's mine and I'm pretty darn frugal. I grew up in Minnesota. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. Please accept this gift as a small token of our appreciation. All right. Thanks, yeah. Dean. I really appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. We're going to be around to answer some questions. Yeah. And and, uh, like I said, if, if you want to come down, I'm happy to answer more questions. <laughs>